Hey man, how's it going? Yeah, I know, right? A hundred thousand subscribers. That's insane, right? No, I haven't really got much of an idea yet. I'm still trying to think about what we can do. No, I, I, I don't know. I think we've done that. We've. No, I'm sure of it. We must have done a video where we've built a NAS from scratch. That seems really obvious. That seems like something we would have done by now, you know? No, no. Look, I'm, I'm just saying, if a channel about network attached storage had been around for this long and had 100,000 subscribers, they would have definitely built a NAS. That seems like such a no-brainer thing to do. Look, look just, I'll, I'll show you. Two secs. I'll send it to you on Skype. Two secs. I'm sure there's something in here. Let's go through our catalogue and have a quick look. No, no, it'll be on there. Don't worry, don't worry. No, definitely, it'll be on there. Don't worry. Absolutely. Seriously, will we never? That is right. Do you know, in all the years we've been doing this, we've never built a NAS from scratch, from the start to the end here on the channel. We've done bits of it and shown you guys how to do it. And we've compared a bunch of open source stuff against a bunch of this turnkey lark, but we've never built one from scratch. And do you know what? What better time than to do it here on our 100,000 sub special video here. Again, if you've been following this channel since the beginning, it's ropey green screen beginnings. Thank you so much for sticking around. And if you're new to the channel, trust me, it does get interesting. When you're talking about a niche within a niche within a niche, tech going into storage, going into NAS, trust me, this is as interesting as it gets. And big old italic marks around that. Myself and Gerald the Seagold here have had a great time. But for me and Eddie here at NAS Compares, building a NAS from scratch would have been very easy. We could have just gone ahead and built anything, couldn't we? You can, you know, get old secondhand stuff from eBay and go, there's a NAS, stick true NAS on it, good night, 100k. But... Let's have a few rules. And the first thing I want to do with building a house from scratch today is I want to see just how little you would have to pay to build one of these. I'm looking at these solutions next to me here that are always sat on the table. These are Intel Celeron, your Pentiums, your 1 gig, your 2.5 gig. I want to see how little I can spend to build one of those. But only build one. I want to go better. I want to upgrade everything about it. So I want to be able to put in more memory. I want to be able to put in more drives. I want to put in more network. And ultimately, I want to show how to do that affordably. And in today's video, we are looking at utilizing the popular John's Bow build. Let's flick over to the screen. Let's move the mic. And we can have a little look what I mean. So in this video, we are going to be utilizing this board here. Now, we could have gone for a standard ITX board and built properly from scratch. But in terms of time, in terms of getting it pre-made, we've decided to go straight over to Ali and go for one of these pre-made Topton style boards here. We're going for the N5105, a CPU that is very popular in a number of different NAS brands right now. And it's available now pre-ready on this uh, motherboard here alongside four gig of memory on a sodium there on a two sodium so we can scale that up anytime we like it also arrives with 128 gig ssd included and that is where our os is going to live right now at the time of recording i've not decided if i'm going to go unraid i've not decided if i'm going to go for an incredibly modest and some might argue underpowered true nas server i don't know if i'm going to go prox mock shit i've not decided but this is the mobile we're going to be going for and on top of that we are going for that john's bow case this is a six bay technically uh, system uh, casing here if you include the extra bay inside but it's really a five bay uh, desktop chassis here available in a couple of colors i think we're going to go for the black one there and this is going to be the base for our build and if we have a little look on the invoice here you're able to see that we got this already ordered and hopefully it's going to be coming very very soon it's aliexpress and we've got the total there we've got the mobo there and that is the 4 gig 128 uh, gig ssd inside there for 149 and we spent 125 there on the chassis all of that including that shipping together alongside that we've gone ahead with the psu inside we're going for a 400 watt sf 
X um, um, power supply here for 40 nicker on Amazon. And of course, we're going to need that Sartus uh, fan out cable there for the inside there. And that is costing us 11 quid 59. So already our price tag isn't gonna be too intimidating there. So for now, now we've got all of our goodies, the next step, flicking back to camera, is going to be the waiting game. I'm sure these things will arrive super quick. God, I missed the World Cup. I've still got that library book. Oh, anyway. Thank you very much. And you. Oh, not too bad, right? Well, there we are. I guess we better start getting this unpacked, right? Okay, so I'm looking at all of this stuff the first time right now, the same as you. And we're going to be as critical as possible about the components we've ordered and the state they have arrived in. So I'm going to be straight with you. I've got some observations. Number one, this cable here. This is our SATA multi-lane cable. And I'll be straight with you. This might be the most overpacked cable I've ever seen. Arriving, this is what we're going to be utilizing for all of those individual SATA bays in the six bay case here. And that little package there, doesn't seem like much, does it? It arrived in an enormous box, environmentally an absolute downer, but we'll move straight on. So there's our cable. Next up, we've got our PSU. There's our big old chunky SFX PSU that we're gonna be needing for this build. And again, arriving fairly standard stuff. We've got our big chunky PSU and it's got all of the adapters. Again, all of the components I've utilized uh, for this uh, today's special video are going to be linked below. So there is our PSU, that brick, uh, that internal uh, PSU block that we're going to be needing there even arrived with a, a US power connector, which is fairly useless to me. Um, and then next up, we have got hopefully our, con uh, our main controller, the MOBO here. So let's get that opened up. And inside, whoa, that is a lot of foam. So we've got a big old pile of foam there. We've got loads of bubble wrap, and hopefully inside here will be our pre-populated board. Again, right now, this is the one that's arriving with that Celeron processor there. It should have an NVMe inside, and it should have the memory included as well. So if it's not inside here, we're going to have to buy new components and add those to the overall total of our spend. But even more foam. Again, sorry, Captain Planet. It's not really working out for us today. Uh, we've got ourselves and a little back plane there. We've got... A single SATA cable. Again, nice that they included it. Incredibly short, but it is an angled cable there. And of course, there is our board itself. So again, not too sure I like the packaging, but I can confirm if I move that round there. Not only has this got our memory module there already pre-included and our SSD there that we're going to be utilizing perhaps for our NAS OS or not. I still haven't quite decided if I'm going to go Unraid or TrueNAS because the CPU on this is a little bit weak there for TrueNAS if you know what I mean. Maybe Unraid will be the way to go but nevertheless we've got a 128 gig drive there and of course if it's Unraid we're not going to need that for our OS but on, the, on board there we've got underneath there no doubt our CPU but overall it's not too shabby. We've got our multi-port LAN and we're gonna have to double check if those are indeed 2.5G but it's pretty much what I would have expected it's quite nice it's quite cleanly put together even came in an anti-static bag I'm not overly bowled over by the level of uh, non-recyclable foam here but still nonetheless not too bad let's move that over there and of course the case now why am I showing this case in all its glory like this well because look at the state of that dent now again we can blame couriers, that's absolutely fine. You know, it's not down to uh, this company themselves, Johnsbo, or the shipping company as well. It, I didn't pay any delivery on this, I understand. I might have to double check that. But still nonetheless, good old hefty dent there. And again, I have opened and kind of perished the plastic there, but I've not opened this fully. So let's have a little look what this looks like in its retail kit. Okay, so we've got our Johnsbo box, and this is what we get included. So straight away, we have got uh, tray guides there. So these are what we utilize on our individual drives. Open those up. So we've got basically our drive handles there. Move those out. We've got a cable tie. Again, branded, strangely. 
um, and we've got all of the rubber sinks there for the individual drives for the tray so it's really a, a hefty DIY approach we're looking at here on top of that we have more cable ties there and we've got some fixings and seals which I assume are for the individual drives we'll have to find that out later on but we can see SSD indicators there inside that box that's all we've got and finally I guess removing more foam uh, but we can have a look at the system itself this is our case and our handy instructions i cannot wait to read through these i'm sure we've got some fantastic grammatical errors here but let's have a little look there is the contents of our box again you should see the state of this over here i might take a picture of this for later and finally we have got our john bow case i'm sorry about the crackling there so straight away there is the case let's bring it close to the camera again do you know what not too bad it's going to be light obviously because it doesn't have the controller board or the drives inside we have a little look we've got that rubberized base panel so rather than four individual feet we've got one larger base panel there on the side loads of ventilation on that side loads of ventilation on that side loads of ventilation there on the top you know it's in a pattern here and then on the rear we've got an inclusive fan that the system arrives with again that's a fan that's already psu equipped and those ports there on the front we've got an audio socket there we've got a usb um, c type uh, connector and a usb type a i imagine those are standard usb i can confirm inside the case that there are wires protruding through there so we are going to be able to attach that to our controller board there so the front panel there, this comes off and it seems to be magnetically sealed. So there is our ventilated and mashed front cover. So I'll be straight, so that's quite a nice case thus far. And inside that is what greets us. There are the controller board inside with those five individual SATA ports there inside. On the right hand side there, we've got a guide key. Again, we'll be finding out more about that. I'm learning this as much as you are with regards to this case at the very least and that's really it at the top there is not really the means to install an lcd panel and punch that through at the top but i'm sure it's not so bad and on the rear there we've definitely got the means to install insert our controller board that we mentioned earlier on and of course luckily they included that back plane something i didn't 100 percent count on there but for now what we're going to do is set up another camera on the right hand side there or my or your right and my left let's find out later on and get a closer look at the assembly of our john's bow nas i tell you what straight away earliest hurdle so far is where exactly i was going to keep the microphone i've got two cameras running right now one in front of me and one just there so i can do the close-up to the box but i'll be straight with you this mic is a nightmare and i've got my backup mic just off shot here just in case but for now let's crack on so there's our case there at the front as shown and if we remove that front panel there have a look and bung that over there and again we're going to be skipping forward back and forth throughout this video inside we've got ourselves our cheeky little allen key there and this is what we need to get through the first stage of access because the first thing we're going to be doing by the way is threading some of the wires but i think it's really important to know that getting this case lid off is what's going to make things infinitely easier there so again we will be fast forwarding at times in this video and i'm willing to bet this will be one of our first ones <laughs> Oops, so let's remove that lid there we go that's what the inside of the casing looks like there nice and clear all the way around pop that on there we've got our bridging cables there pop those out and of course there is the back so the next thing we want to do is remove this bit here so we'll grab ourselves our screwdriver here and start removing our panels so first things first we're taking off the PSU cover for those that aren't aware this system arrives with a plate that we need to attach to our PSU the reason being is that's kind of what's going to hold it in that cavity because different PSUs have different sizes so we're going to need to attach this plate that I'm removing now onto the PSU as we go have a quick look don't know what the weather like where you are is but it's absolutely boiling here in the uk of a rare treat for us 
It's a bit of a nightmare to be wearing a black shirt and hunched over a couple of cameras and about five different lighting rigs. Still nonetheless, we've got our panel off and we also now have to remove the thumb screws there in order to remove the fan. The reason being, the reason we're removing the fan is we're going to need, sorry about that being so close to the mic, we're going to need to thread the SATA multi-lane cable and the fan power cable into the back of this back plane. Pop that there. So removing that, we can now remove our internal fan. So there's our internal fan. Indeed, it is branded John's bow there. So there's the fan. Just going to pop that there for now. So that you can have a good look at the internals. So there is our main board. We've got the five SATA connectors there at the top alongside the fan connector there and again that's going to be taking advantage of two molex connectors there that are going to be coming off that psu and that power is not only going to power each of the individual sata drives but it's also going to be powering uh, the fan that's connected via that pass-through connector there so again i'm just gonna to have to remove this lid because i'm starting to run out of space ever so slightly um, so the next thing we want to do is we get that angle just right is we're going to need RPSU. Now, before this, we're just going to leave that there because the next step is going to be threading the multi lane cable. The reason we're doing this now is because later on, this block is going to be occupied by the PSU, and at the top, there's going to be that controller board. So it's incredibly important that we thread the PS, uh, the SATA cable, I should say, the SATA multi lane now while we've got the chance now given the proximity i'm using um, a 50 centimeter cable here i don't need that much length but still nonetheless i'm just going to filter it down so there's a small cavity there on the side you can see my finger there and that is where we need to filter this so hopefully you're i'm fast forwarding through the dull bits here and there it is threaded through that portion there at the back again that's going to be necessary later on um, for when we put in the main controller board but for now as you can see these cables are individually numbered there that's because each of those cables you can't lose track of which one of those is going into uh, the individual SATA ports and they're numbered one two three four five counting downwards so we've just got to make sure that we use the right cables for each one of these let's get those in now as you can see we've attached all four of those to the appropriate connector there and we've got one left over because i did get a six port multi-lane just in case i wanted to add an additional sata drive somewhere along the line again it normally costs absolutely nothing extra to get that and where possible i would also recommend looking out for angled cables for reasons you can see there as well as on the other end when you connect to the mobo um, but we remove that cable and there's going to be a lot of draping over the side i'm sure you're going to see throughout this because the next thing we need to do is add our PSU. now it's going to be really critical that we get this right because once we thread this in the main barrier we're going to find while putting this in is separating the individual cables that are most needed now if we block these these three cables here are dedicated PS, uh, sorry, a controller board cables. You've got your main one there, and if you're running graphics cards or additional cards that require additional board power or straight onto card power, that's where those three live. So we're going to come back to those later on. But the ones we care about right now are these two black ones. These are called our Molex connectors there. These little Molex power are the ones we're going to thread through here, but crucially... We need to use this cavity here on the side and thread them around. So whether we take all of the cable, uh, and we take all of the combined SATA power cable, or just the Molex, we need to thread that around. Because all of those have to live over here, because they're on one long bind cable all the way through. And that means that leaves us to go inside here with our remaining board power so the board power cables need to come in here and then we pull them through the top of the cable while that screw is driving me close to madness there so there we go we've got our molex power coming out the side here we've got our main board power coming out the top and from there 
the motherboard can uh, the PSU can slot straight in there as needed now before we put that in it's important that we go ahead and attach this adapter uh, this little plate while we have the opportunity the reason being because this is what we need to secure this to the inside of that case and so I'm going to go ahead and screw that in now Right, so now we've attached the plane onto that. We can, again, make sure these controller board cables hang out and the Molex and SATA power also remain out and we can slot that there into place. And then we can go ahead and reattach those other cables, uh, the other screws from earlier when we removed that PSU. It's also worth highlighting while I do this that some of the steps that I'm going through here may be different to the steps that you might take. Again, some users may choose to connect everything, the motherboard, the main boards, all of the storage, long before they go ahead and put it inside the case, just to double check everything works. Now, if I'm honest, that is what I would normally do. I would normally go ahead, lay everything out on the table and attach it and put it together. But for the sake of this video and showing the build, I thought it best to kind of put it together here on camera for you. And there is our first error of the video. I've used the Allen key screws. Well, what I really wanted to use was these ones here. So again, I'm probably gonna leave in all of the mistakes because we're all human, right? Um, but let's get this PSU fitted into the case. But again, remember, you don't necessarily have to do that. And in most cases, if you're not making like a YouTube video or anything, it may well be within your interest to build your um, NAS on the table before installing it in the case. Okay, so now that PSU is in, let's lift that back up to camera. The next thing we need to do is get these Molex connectors connected to those Molex is there. It's not gonna matter what order you put them in because it's all gonna be delivered from the same power supplier, but I do recommend going for the bottom one first because you will find it a lot easier to get the second one in if you install the bottom one first. That really only counts for this case, because a lot of cases you'll use, you'll have the bare board looking down on, so you've got a full nice blank canvas. But when it comes to more close-knit systems and close-knit casing like this one, it's a lot easier to put the lower connectors in first before you install the uh, upper ones. Now, the last thing we're thinking about here with the back of this case, you can just make that out, is that small white connector there. That is where we need our fan connector to go into. So what we're gonna do is ever so slightly unthread that, and we're gonna install that uh, fan connector into that white port. So we'll pop that in there. And now that's connected. So the next thing we need to do is bind in those cables into that cavity. Again, you could have used the cavity here at the top because there'll be a very narrow amount of space here for us to use, but it's not recommended for everyone and their own personal setups. But for now, we've got our case connectors. The fan is in a cage, so we don't have to worry about it connecting with the fan at all. And we can lower that in and lever it against those cables nice and easily. Let's thread that over there. There we go, so now we've reattached, we've got the PSU in place, we've got the fan reattached, and on the top of this case, we have got our SATA uh, connectors here, ready to connect with our controller board. We have got, on the right hand side, our main power to board connectors from the PSU, and finally, we have got the series of cables here from our front panel. Now again, the front panel is where things are gonna get fiddly later on. I'm not entirely certain how I'm gonna show that to you, but for now, we're getting on to the next big stage here, which is going to be putting in our controller board. So what we're gonna do here is bring this a lot closer to camera. Hopefully you're getting a good angle there of what we're about to do. We're just making sure all of those cables are nicely bound there on that side, because what we need to do now is get ready for our controller board there, and again, there's a close-up of the board already set up. Sorry if the sound is being dampened. Uh, next thing we want to do is get hold of our back plane. So we've already unpacked the back plane there, as you can see. And what we need to do is just get that in position. So we pop that there face up. It's important you have the ethernet cables there on that side. 
and pop that into place and wait till you hear it click like so. Again, I apologize for those listening with headphones for how loud that might have been. So next up, we go ahead and get our controller board. Again, be sure to match up the ethernet connectors there with the ethernet space there on that board. And then very gently slide the board into place. Now, you'll know when you get it connected in correctly because you'll hear it click. But moreover, meet the alignment of the four screw holes at either corner of this controller board. That is when you know you've got the alignment correct. So now we've got the alignment lined up for those, I can go ahead and start attaching those in. Again, make sure everything's in alignment. As you can see there, it's all connected in appropriately. So there you go, we've now got the main controller board in place. Let's grab those cables out of the way. There is our main controller board there. And if we look on the back, there is all of the ports in place. So the next thing we want to do is start attaching in our SATA connectors here. So if we elongate these, we're gonna keep them bound. It's not gonna damage the cables at all. And what we need to do is make sure we attach the correct corresponding cable there, numbered one to six, into the appropriate one to six juncture here. So as we can see, it's counting in at one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can go ahead and put those in. So starting with number one. Again, we're going to attach that sixth SATA connector just because that sixth SATA connector there, although it's not connected to a drive at the moment, it's better to get it out of the way now. So as you can see, there is all the connected SATA drives there at the top. And again, there's a link to a whole article in the description. And again, we can store that down there. We can funnel it back into that cavity if we choose. Uh, but for now, next up, we want to attach our individual powers. So for this board, really the only connector of serious note is this one at the top so you just make sure it is matching uh, with the square with the squares so as you can see there so we get that inside that connection port you'll hear it click that's how you know it's in and we've fully connected the power on this device now also make sure that we've got to attach the additional ATX power for the board, otherwise all services won't be resumed, so we can get that in there. Some PSUs have a split, where it's a PSU that can be separated across two, and some of them have it in a single connector, so that will change depending on your PSU of choice. Now, one thing I didn't really touch on earlier was the fact that when doing this, and we were going through here and looking at the packaging and that incredible, arguably environmental disaster, that is the way this motherboard is packed. One thing I will say, it does include any manuals. And going online, whether you're looking at Topton's own website, where Topton, you know, kind of provides a lot of these motherboards used by others, or some of the rebranded alternatives, all of those are going to lead to the pins for your front-mounted USB, your F panel, being different. And that becomes something of a problem when you don't have the manuals online, even when you download them from online, because the range of pins will differ when it comes through different motherboards. And the result is, there's going to be an element of trial and error as we try to attach the individual power buttons and we try to attach the front USB. Immediately, one of the things that's become very apparent in this build is we're gonna need an adapter or a converter in order to take advantage of the front USB here, something I will have to look into later on with this dual USB M2 casing here. But for now, what I'm gonna do very quickly is just do some trial and error off camera because it's gonna take way too long on these individual pins with the power connected to see if the power is functioning appropriately. So up to this point, I'll be straight with you, things have gone relatively smooth and bar one tiny little bump along the road, this has actually been an incredibly seamless experience till 
now because as i was getting ready to do the first initial boot up test of this device i got the pins also installed incorrectly fun fact when you're trying to get hold of the software manual for this you have to go all the way through to the aliexpress page which will then redirect you to the own manufacturer's page which by the way does not google very well and does not rank very high at all on page one of google you eventually find uh, the pdf that has the breakdown for the software manual for this to work out which one of the pins is correct and although they are color coded it is always, always, always important to double check the manual before you go ahead and install pins. The front header pens, that front panel there, those pins generally will not hurt your device if they're installed wrong because they control the LEDs for the hard drives, the mainline LEDs on the front, and of course the power switch, and there's a reset pin for certain motherboards. However, still nonetheless, you should always consult the manual, particularly when you're going down the road of looking at some of the power connected devices regardless. However, once I'd overcome that hurdle and got the whole thing powered up and put together, the PSU wouldn't work. That's right. For those of you that aren't aware, when you do get a PSU, one of the things you'll notice when you first connect it is a light crackle when you get it installed. And you'll also see the fan rotate for the very first time. And in the case of this PSU, we saw nothing. We got it connected in there. We saw no LEDs coming on on the motherboard there. And regardless of the fact that we installed the additional power needed for the ATX and the main MOBO connector there, we still didn't see power. So what did that mean? Well, it meant an RMA. We got this device sent back to Amazon and we got a new one sent through in a nice plastic bag. So again, it wasn't the most protected PSU. I think it was a lot cheaper as well, but nevertheless, it arrived. I know it looks like I'm wearing the same shirt for this video and that's what I'm doing for consistency, but you can already tell from my beard on my hair, this is not the same day as the previous part of the recording. So we got that PSU installed and I'm pleased to say it's working, but just to give you some indication before we seal the case up, what we're gonna do is get the fan there. You'll also notice when I boot this up for the first time, just uh, the initial fan noise as well but do bear in mind while we're doing this that that fan noise is just an initial test that is not going to be the consistent noise of the fan on this case but let's go we've got our PSU connector and get that connected in put that in there and with our fan connected there we can go ahead and press the button for power so as we can see and here we've got the beep we've got the fan there we've got the device booting we've got our PSU fan we bring that camera in there you're able to see there at the top the PSU fan is kicking off there nicely at the front of the system we've got our LED there showing that our front panel or F panel is connected effectively and on top we have got the full connection as I try to do that there and my um, as you can see there from the other camera um, this uh, tripod has got an auto gyroscope there that is not enjoying the ride so as you can see there, we've got everything connected up while it's doing the test there, and we've got the fan on the table. So the next thing I want to do, flick into the other camera, is of course, we want to go ahead and reassemble the parts of this case and get this booted up for our Unraid installation. That's right, I decided to go for Unraid on this. I debated long and hard about whether to go with TrueNAS, or whether to go with Unraid, as I move that mic away from the fan. Ultimately, because of that CPU, I just thought with true now we would be buckling ourselves very early doors but bear in mind we can also go if we wanted to down a proxmox route so we're going down unraid for the simplicity and also the efficiency of this six bay system so let's get this case put back together let's disconnect that power there get that powered down get that powered off now just before we do put the lid back on i should touch on another thing that i encountered during the course of this build that will definitely affect some of you out there and may require you to spend another 10 to 20 nicker depending where you are in the world but also i'm not going to do it for this video but it is worth highlighting and it is to do with those front usbs because this case the n2 does utilize uh, different connectors as you can see here on screen bring that close to the other camera different connectors than those found traditionally on your motherboard there. And the result is you're gonna be needing adapters to get these connected with your main board. The case, uh, the board I'm going with here, this uh, Topton board here, unfortunately, as you can see, and again, we're probably gonna overlay a video that's gonna be a lot clearer on this, we've got our FUSB connector on the main panel there 
but of course it doesn't match either one of these two so we're going to need to use that adapter but also use a splitter in order to take advantage of both of them but nonetheless if you do want to take advantage of that that is a thing you can do but just bear in mind that by doing so you're going to need to spend that little bit extra on those adapters which have hopefully arrived on screen but otherwise we're going to bind those back into the little pouch that i created there on the side for those cables we've also got the cable ties being applied so what i'm going to do is get the top of this case now reapplied right on there and then what we're going to do is get our unraid usb key ready and get this installed with unraid so i'm just going to fast forward to the connection of the visual output the keyboard and the mouse and get on with the unraid installation so next up we're going to need to put unraid on this bad boy aren't we and straight away it's worth highlighting the other reason we went for unraid is just because it's got such a low footprint but it's surprisingly very very user friendly something we talked about in the channel before if you've seen my other videos i'm going to skim over this a lot because we have gone over the installation methodology for unraid several times but i will skim over it very very briefly first thing you're going to need of course is a usb drive i'm going for the same sandisk 32 gig ssd that we've used for our other unraid installations here on the channel uh, but again if you do want to get a hold of that it will be linked in the description but ultimately pretty much any usb is going to be useful you want something with a modicum of speed we're talking 100 megs or so uh, try to go for a reliable brand there because this is ultimately where uh, unraid is going to be loaded from onto the memory of the system there now with unraid there's actually several different methods of installing unraid and again we're going to go over it very very quickly because i've gone over it in a lot more detail in other videos otherwise check out space invaders one he's done a whole bunch of guides on unraid installations do check him out but um the main reason uh, the main methodology i should say that people normally use is to use the usb creator tool make sure your usb is already pre-installed something i've already done and make sure it's connected to the pc you're using and you can download the usb creator for your host uh, client system you're utilizing in this case a windows system alternatively and you might need this later on you can download a zip version of the latest version of unraid there and another tool that we're going to talk about later on is of course rufus and of course if you want to go through any of the guides during the installation today there is a link to the manual installation method and there's a uh, custom installation methods as well but say you wanted to go with installing unraid in the most express way possible for that that is where you want to use the first tool that we uh, talked about there which was the unraid creator uh, the unraid creator let's get that opened up there you might have seen a black screen there and the Unraid Creator there, what it's going to do is scan your system for USB drives there. As you can see, it's found my USB that I've connected there, that SanDisk one, but it is stating it is incompatible. Some USB drives, due to moody SSDs in the market, or just not passing certain thresholds, will be listed as uncompatible. If your USB doesn't appear, by the way, a quick method you can go for is go into the search at the bottom and search for the word disk part. Once you search for the word disk part, you may see a black screen there because of admin rights there. Then put in the command list disk. From list disk, it will list the drives that are on your system. And if the USB you're looking for is listed here, but not listed on the general layout, you can select the disk in question, in my case, disk two. And if you need to format a drive, remember it will delete uh, the index for that and pretty much it will stop you accessing the data on it uh, effectively formatted. Just type the word clean and tap enter but make sure you've selected the correct disk that you are using i've already done that for this video now if your usb is showing as compatible it's nice and simple just select the latest version you want give the name of your system that you want to give it it's tower by default select the version of unraid that you want generally you can select between uh, stable or you can go ahead with local zip downloads if you choose or the most recent available version you can flick between them and if your usb is supported you'll be able to access it there but what if it's not supporting what if just like my one it is showing as incompatible well that is where that tool rufus comes in because when you use rufus what you can do is ultimately um create any usb is a bootable usb something we're going to need to do here for unraid now there are two different ways to do it the first way you can do it if you're using an os that is supplied to you and an I, I iso form that's a digital disk you can use that option select the disk in question it will be like a, a bin in a queue file uh, normally in a, a kind of contained folder there and you'll be able to use those in there and go ahead and format them but what if you don't much like unraid have 
an ISO. There is, isn't really an ISO for Unraid readily accessible. Well, that was why earlier on we went ahead and downloaded that version of Unraid. When you download that version of Unraid, it appears here. And what we need to do, the first thing we need to do is use Rufus once again. Go into Rufus from there, select a drive. You might have a drive that says no name or SanDisk or whatever on there. Select the option for non bootable. From there, because you won't have to select an image, go down and give the volume name Unraid. It's got to be in capitals, no spaces, no brackets, just the word Unraid. And we're doing that because we need to format our disk to FAT32. And if a drive is larger than 32 gig, then your system will have difficulty formatting it to FAT32, if you're, particularly if you're a Windows user. And therefore, Rufus will allow you to format that drive to FAT32 very easily. If you've got a drive under 32 gigs, you'll be fine. But over 32, you can use this method. So I've already formatted this drive. That is why I have a USB here that's listed as the word Unraid. I've already used Rufus already to format this drive. If you want to go ahead with it, click Start. But what it will give you is a USB drive like this one called Unraid. So what we need to do is go back to that downloaded version of Unraid that we saw earlier on, select Extract Files. From there, select the Unraid USB, the one that we've created there, and then click OK. It will now extract the contents of that zip folder onto our USB. But before we remove the USB and plop it inside our M2 uh, system here, what we need to do is make a couple of very quick changes to that USB to make it bootable for the system. It's extracting it there, so we can go ahead now and go into that USB. As you can see now, it's full of files. So depending on the motherboard you are using, you may need to change this here, this bootable EFI. Uh, in most cases, you need to delete that minus symbol there. Again, I strongly recommend you check out that guide I mentioned earlier on. This is the one we've highlighted in previous videos, and it does go into whether if you need to enable e, um, so UEFI boot, depending on the default settings of your motherboard, you may need to make that change. Um, the other thing you need to do in a Windows environment, and again, depending on your other environments, you'll have to use them appropriately because they'll be supported. Go ahead and double click that file, make bootable, and then click enter. And now that USB is ready to go for an Unraid installation there. So again, we're just going to go ahead, go to the bottom, safely disconnect that drive, right click, safely disconnect our SanDisk USB. And now I'm going to move over to getting some hard drives installed inside this system, getting this USB installed, and then trying to get the boot up of our Unraid and, fingers crossed, make our way over to our new homegrown NAS. So let's move this USB just over here, because we will be needing that later on, and make our way over to the hard drives. For this build, I've decided to go absolutely rogue. Because we're going to be using Unraid, I decided, why stay uniform? Why stick with the same drives? Why not take advantage of Unraid's ability to use different drives down the road? So again, we've got a 20TB, we've got a 10TB, we've got a 4TB, and we've got a 14TB. I know this is madness. You wouldn't normally use such differing drives, but I just wanted to really focus on the fact that Unraid allows us to do that. Now, three of these drives I've already prepped, but I wanted to save the last prep for you guys just to show you exactly how these go in. Because of all the things about this build in this case, I think the fan is a little noisier than I would like, but I will say that the drive installation I really do miss real trays and that's one thing about this device i'm not overly keen on there so what we need to do with this is we go ahead and prepare and i'll move over to the other camera these small rubber sealers right so these screw on in four separate corners of our drive we go ahead and we screw them into individual corners now bear in mind that the top of the drive is going to need uh, sorry the top of the drive here is going to have our rubber handle so do leave those ones alone so you go ahead and you screw these into the individual plots now the other thing you have to do is not go too tight carry on and screw in until the screw is flush with the seal no more than that the reason for that will become clear later on so we go ahead and we install those in we can fast forward and pop those in because we need to get ready to put in our 
weird little seal. Now again, with the seals at the top, I will say, the reason I miss having trays inside this is although certainly the kind of uh, install and removal of drives is still very firm inside this, I'm not overly keen on this weird little strap from John's boat. Not a fan of that. Now you put a seal in each one of those ends and just like before, we install it here at the top. We pop it there. Again, the direction might change uh, in terms of where you want the handle. We pop that on the top and we pop that on the bottom. Again, we'll do a quick tighten with a screwdriver afterwards, particularly on these handles. But that's really how we install our handles. I'm not overly keen on that, but apparently that is the done way. So we'll do a very quick tighten for those. Make sure they're flush. Pop that there. And there you go. That is our handled drive good to go. So let's move that there rotate our mic a little bit so we remove there's our handle there on the side it's slightly magnetized filter panel and there is our individual bays there so let's go ahead and start installing our drives so again as you can see the alignment there at the bottom if we bring that closer you can see the alignment there of those SATA ports there at the base so we can go ahead and pop those in right, fast forward a moment and this is where those rubber seals come into play because you're meant to meet the alignment of those little grooves and then here the drive click in there is our first drive so let's fast forward and install the rest of our drives and we've still got a spare drive there for later down the line and there's additional rubber sealed hooks inside the casing with a spare as well i'm not overly keen on these and removal doesn't feel great because this feels like this is elastic. Sorry about the lighting there. Let's resolve that. But overall, still happy with them going in there. And now we can reinstate our casing cover. And boom, that is it. We've got our case ready to go. Let's click over to the other camera. And now we go ahead and grab our USB drive, which I'm going to connect into one of the rear ports because the last thing I want to do is ever accidentally remove that. Again, we've got USB 2 or USB 3 port. I'm just going to use that one there. We've got it installed inside. So next thing we're going to do is set this device up with our HDMI out, connected through, install our power and start beginning our Unraid installation. Okay, so I think it's time to boot our system. I've already done a provisional test, as you can see there on screen, and everything seems to be booting fine, at least until the um, beginning boot sequence for the motherboard. But before we go any further, we have to get a few things out of the way. One, we've got a USB keyboard connected to this system, but just so I can record everything here on screen, I am using a capture card here that allows me to capture this into the laptop you're watching here. Unfortunately, that means that everything is in pretty close proximity right now. We've got around about 70 centimeters between the laptop and the NAS, and I'm gonna be straight with you. You are definitely going to hear the 20 TB drive inside this system. But for now, let's go ahead and boot this up and we'll make our way into BIOS. In the case of this motherboard, we need to use the delete key here. So we're just gonna go ahead and just get ready to go into the setup there using the delete. And what that'll do is allow us to go ahead and go and sort out the BIOS because inside we've got an NVMe drive as well, remember? So it's gonna be interesting to see what exactly the brand did with that NVMe. Did they format it in advance? Does it have a provisional OS on it? Does it have their proprietary OS? Something I really, really doubt. But for now, let's go ahead and make our way into BIOS. We'll make our way along to the top. Come out. As we can see, we've got the USB drive there as our primary boot, but that NVMe appears to have free BSD on it. So I think it would be remiss of us, right? Not to see what's on it, right? We should definitely see what's on it. So let's do an override. Let's override and boot directly into that 120 gig uh, NVMe SSD. And I can see we've got two, um, we got a partition built into that as well. So do you know what? You can skip ahead if you choose, but I'm gonna find out just what is on this. Let's go ahead and override that boot and see what exactly, ah, we've got PF sent. So let's go ahead and see. So we've got PF Sense by default already pre-installed on this, which is pretty sweet. But I think for now, let's go ahead and return to that USB boot. We already know it's the initial boot there. So again, I wouldn't advise you do it that way. Normally you should safe boot out of that PF Sense. But for now, 
let's go ahead and restart the screen will reflash and this time I'm not going to use the USB keyboard here I'm not going to go into BIOS because we could already see that that USB drive was the default boot option so what I'm going to do is quickly move that mic there so hopefully it's not too close so you can hear that 20 TB right not my phone going off I'll leave that to go into the Unraid boot sequence there and hopefully with that either the USB will boot immediately or we can make our way through the setup option. So there we go we've got our options there with what we want to go ahead with we're going to skip the auto boot and i think for now we're not going to do a memory test we've only got four gig to play with on this let's go ahead and initialize our unraid os on our n2 system there leaving it to do its thing while it boots into unraid for us there we make our way into the primary desktop and what we're going to do after that is we're going to skip away from the hdmi output and use uh, advanced ip scanner to find a, on a device on our local area network or hopefully we'll get an idea of the ip here appearing via the hdmi output that will allow us to find the unraid nas for us to play with once it publishes the IP for us there. And then from there, we can have a little look at Unraid running on this, have a little check that everything is running fine, that it sees all of the drives, and ultimately start wrapping up this video. There we have, we have ourselves our IP. So I'm just gonna rotate this here so I can make my way in. Hopefully there won't be too much noise for you. I'm trying to do as fewer breaks in recording as possible as the system boots up. There is our OS version. There is our IPv4 identity. We haven't set up a v6. And now we're just gonna wait for the tower login to present itself. It should be root uh, by default. That's the usual default um, password there. So let's make our way in. There we go. Let's head our way in, go back into that browser from earlier. It was 192.168.1. Was it 233? Do we see there? Let's double check. Wrong one there. It was no 227. My mistake. So we'll go into 227. And boom, now we're logged into Unraid on the N2 here. So let's give ourselves a quick password. And there you go, we got ourselves our Unraid server. It is that straightforward. Again, always a big fan of this software. Again, you can carry on with the trial pretty much straight away and you get that for 30 days using the trial of all the services. But of course you can register and get yourself a key. Again, we could open it up in another tab. We've already talked about it before, it's a one-off payment. Right, so now we've activated our license. We've got it all set up on there for our trial key all the way through. And ultimately, it does look like this thing is running great. Two of the drives that I have used are very old drives that we've used here on the channel. One of which was actually featured in our data recovery episode a little while ago, the WD Purple there. So when we were looking at this system and what it could do, well, even immediately, those drives were clearly being recognized because when we went into the storage area for this system and started assigning drives, it automatically started clocking that these drives had sector problems so again when it comes to unraid as you can see all the drives were recognized immediately we can just go ahead right now let's say that 20 tb drive is going to be our parity disk or we can go ahead and start banging in some of all of these drives and just have them all in that lovely mixed capacity we can even utilize the caching drive there's the uh, health issues that i mentioned earlier on related to those individual drives that older generation um, 40 BWD purple that we used in our data recovery episode that went live earlier this week I understand so again we can assign ourselves a lovely little NVMe there and then straight after that if we've assigned those we can start playing with our pools and again all of this oh we can't call it that of course um we can go ahead and just give it a name and start assigning data to these pools and start assigning these drives and just go ahead and create our perfect Unraid server on this, just like we would a turnkey NAS solution within its own software. And if you're worried about apps and plugins, again, head to the plugin section. Cannot recommend enough Nerd Tools. It is. It should always be the first app that any Unraid user goes ahead and installs in. Go to the App Center, just search for the word Tools, and you will find it. It's one of the earliest tools you will find, Nerd Tools. Go ahead, install it in there, make sure you pin it in, head to the tool section, and then from there, you will be able to find some lovely, lovely abilities within this application there. Go to Installed Tools there, go into Nerd Tools, go into Actions, go into Settings, and boom. You have a huge range of things you can do with this that 
I would argue, puts it in rivalry with Turnkey NAS Solutions. Just looking at some of these features and functions that you're able to take advantage of with this one plugin in Unraid is pretty darn good. And of course, when we're looking at this NAS, we want to know that everything's working. And we can look at the system devices, look at the CPU, how it's dealing with it, looking at those 2.5 gig NICs, each of the individual drives. And from what I can see, everything barring those front USBs, because of the adapters needed for this particular board, is functioning there all the leds are working there we can even look at fan control and more it's all functioning the way we'd want to see it and ultimately for me that is why this build as an unraid build with that slightly more modest cpu is tremendously desirable but let's focus on things so let's wrap things up and go back to the original question of this video of a build uh, do it yourself nas versus that of a turnkey so when it comes to the amount of money we have spent unsurprisingly the john's bow n2 build that we opted for in this video today landslides turnkey now solutions in terms of what you are paying let's take a real moment to think about what the cost of that was the motherboard with that cpu if you didn't go for the memory upgrade you didn't go for adding an m2 nvme it would have cost 127 nick at 20 uh, 72 if you include that 4 gig of memory and the 128 gig SSD, you might want it for an OS drive, you might want it for caching. That's 149 NICA 37. Now, the case was 74 NICA 60. Uh, the SATA multi lane cables, £11.59. And although the original PSU that we saw retailed at 40 quid, that one bust, and we bought the new one at 250 watts, it only cost us 25 quid. Now, Overall, that means, as a bare-bones build, it set us back £238.90. If you include the memory and the M2 NVMe and that USB drive, it retails, we would have spent £260.56. There Again, include 5 to 10 nick of, It's kind of leeway for the USB there, which again means, on the wallet, that is pretty darn good good now that of course didn't include delivery that did include tax but the delivery was 29 pounds 40 and on top of that if we wanted to go down the road of adding more into nvme base via a pcie slot maybe a converter there in the middle it would have cost a little bit more but at the moment for the physical build it's 260 nicker but we still got to talk software so on top of that 260 nicker we of course had to add Unray. Now we went for the trial one, but say we'd gone for it long term, that would have set us back an additional $59 if we'd gone for just a simple six bays there to go on the storage. But if we want to take advantage of an additional SATA drive with the SATA bay that was available inside, if we want to use M2 bays for storage, we'd have had to scale things up, which means we would have had to gone for the plus license from Unray, which would have set us back $89. So again taking into account conversions and more i think we're still looking at somewhere in the region of about 320 330 quid we would have spent on this so again that's the complete package if you wanted to add those usb adapters there to take advantage of those on the front which no doubt you would that's another 12 15 nicker total so again let's go nuts and just say 350 nicker to get this with the intel seller on n5105 with 4 gig of memory with the software with all of it call it 350 quid give or take because of shipping's going to differ for a lot of you how does that scale against likewise systems like this and again we're gonna look at six bay systems because that's what that board inside allowed us to do so if we look at again five to six bay systems if we started with qnap that would put us in the range uh, of the ts664 uh their 2020 um two gen 2022 2023 generation of releases that retails for 699 quid so again, we are looking at double the price that we've spec'd up for this. If we look at Synology, they don't have an Intel Celeron system of like this. So which means you'll either have to go for the DS920 or the DS423, stuff like that, which again would have been smaller system, or you go for their 6 by the DS1621+, Plus, which has a PCIe upgrade slot, which has M2 NVMe upgrade slots. But that would have set you back 894 so close to 900 Pounds. For Acer Store, it would have been the AS6706T. 
that is the Gen 2 Locker Store Series of 6 man, although that does have 4 M2 slots via a PCIe upgrade card, let's bear that in mind, that still would have set you back £819 at the time of recording. And finally, of course, Terra Master we talked about before, that would be the T6 Four two three six bay we've reviewed on the channel. Same CPU, M2 slot inside as well, two two point five gig slots there, and that would set you back six hundred ninety nine pounds. So again, pretty much seven hundred pounds. None of those including delivery. All of them being at least four gig of memory, with the Ace store being eight gig, and all of them either two point five gig or the option to scale up with a PCI upgrade card. What are we saying? This is going to be half, in some cases, even more uh, of a saving than all of those solutions we talked about. However, there's no denying that Unraid on this is going to require more skills. With this, oh, alongside Unraid, there is the physical time and energy that goes into building. There is having multiple warranties with which you have to consider. That PSU failed us. During the course of this recording, that PSU, yeah, I'm going to get my money back, but that PSU, I've had to waste time on this. And time, for a lot of users, is money. The setup, getting the whole device together, and the peace of mind that comes from a closed, ready-to-go system cannot be overestimated. Now, is that peace of mind worth three to 400 nicker? That's really up to you. But ultimately, what I've learned from this video, and indeed when we've done any of our comparisons between DIY, uh, an open source or open source adjacent solutions, and turnkey, is it comes down to how much is your time worth. Because although for you, you have watched this video, which must be, must be rolling in for about 50 minutes to an hour, I've not done the editing yet, the time spent researching for this build to get the bits together, getting the device here, going through the back and forth, some of the testing. Yes, I've had to do it in a very specific way to be shown to you, but the time I spent finding uh, that PDF of the, um, the motherboard manual that this arrived with, the back and forth, and of course the time that was spent waiting for this system in its components to arrive from AliExpress and other vendors, that is gonna eat away into the whole time is money profit margin. Now, if I was uh, poor uh, money, poor time rich, a disgusting sentence, but here we are, then it would make sense for me um, it, to go for a turnkey now solution to throw money at the problem. But if I've got time and I don't have a lot of bunts to play with, this is still a great solution. It is a very nice case. I'm not too sure I like these on the front here i'm not too sure how i feel about those trays but with the exception of those it is a very well put together system i think the fan is a little noisy not too bad but the rest of it i really really like and it was not a complex build by any measure now i've taken lots of photos throughout this and hopefully in the next week or two i'll have a detailed article below with every single step so if you decide to go down the jaws uh, the john's boat um, into nas route and you want to go for some of the beefier top 10 cards out there some of your i3s and particularly we're seeing some rather advanced stuff coming out from the east which you'll see in aliexpress alongside those cards this may perfectly be the system for you with a beefier um, psu of course but this has been diy with the john's bow n2 versus turnkey and of course this is our 100k special thank you once again i won't labor it too much more thank you so much for watching if you subscribe from the beginning thank you so much if you subscribe very recently thank you so much and ultimately if you stayed here through to the end of the video you are my guys you are the people that help me and help eddie and just help us at nas compares just the two of us get it done and thank you so much for that thank you so much for watching i won't labor it i will see you next time